Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the session number two of this thurs third day of the Right to Energy Forum 2023. Um, I think everyone has um, had great discussions and uh, yeah, thought provoking sessions. I know I have in the past two days uh, and today we're taking things a bit more global. Uh, we've heard in the past few days about um, numbers about, you know, how energy poverty affects people on the global level uh, and not just in Europe. So this session is about discussing global right to clean and affordable energy. Um, I won't speak any longer. I'll give the floor to our amazing panelists. Uh, we have four people here, but we'll get started with uh, Hadley Taylor, who's from Canada and who works as a program manager at Sustainable Energy for All. And her role focuses on working with partners to accelerate speed and scale in addressing the energy access gap, particularly in Africa. So Hadley, if you wanna take it away. Yeah, thank you, Miriam, and um, and yeah, thanks thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me and inviting Sustainable Energy for All to speak on this topic because, uh, as the name suggests, it's something that's very close to our heart and really drives our mission. Um, so, for those that don't know, Sustainable Energy for All, also known as SE for All. We're an international organization and we work very closely in partnership with the United Nations and leaders in um, government, the private sector, financial institutions, civil society, and even philanthropies to really drive faster action towards the achievement of SDG 7, so Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is access to um, affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all by 2030. And it's important for us as an organization, of course, that this is done um, in line with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So we really see ourselves as an organization that sits at the nexus um, between the climate and development agenda. Um, so to talk a little bit about the challenge, I mean, I, I understand that um, this, this whole um, forum has been dedicated to this topic, so maybe this is not new information. Um, but just to kind of recap on really what the challenge is. So globally, there are more than 750 million people that still live in the dark and have no access to electricity. Um, and if we look even beyond that, there are about 3 billion that are living in energy poverty, which would be what we consider less than 1,000 kilowatt hours of power per year. Because of course, we don't just consume um, energy at home. Um, think about, you know, street lights and schools and community services and hospitals. Those are all services that also need reliable energy. So we see the number um, of those living without that, those reliable services and that reliable power being closer to 3 billion, although that's, it's a number that's still very hard to count. Um, and so if that wasn't enough, a big enough of a challenge for us, um, we can also look over at the clean cooking side as well. So there are about 2.6 billion people that lack access to clean cooking. So just, you know, imagine that, that most of these people are cooking with either firewood or charcoal um, or, or kind of traditional cook stoves or a three stone fire, often indoors. And it's really the women and children that are um, often involved in the cooking process and are breathing in really harmful um, smoke from that process, which has devastating health impacts. I'm not sure on the, the global statistic, but we know that at least in Sub-Saharan Africa, the smoke inhalation related deaths is actually more than malaria and AIDS combined per year. So this is, this is a huge health crisis. And we also know that it, it has devastating impacts on economies too. Um, the worldwide cost of using these traditional fuels is about 2.4 trillion uh, USD per year um, because of the adverse um, impacts on health, as I mentioned, but also climate, lost productivity um, and the environment and also deforestation. Um, so if you think of it, SDG 7 is really an enabler of all the other SDGs. We know it has direct impacts on economic development, gender equality, educational levels and achievements, health, even nutritional impacts if we look at cold value chains for medicines and food. 
So the obvious question would then be, okay, why don't we just, you know, extend the electrical lines and distribute clean cook stoves for everyone and the rest of the SDG agenda will fall in line. Um, but of course, it's, you know, it's not that simple. If only it were that easy. Um, the challenge is really twofold. So the first is that most of these people that live um, in energy poverty or without electricity um, are living below the poverty line or, you know, just marginally above it. And what's more is that many of these people are living in energy poverty, they live in rural and remote communities that are far away from the existing national grid, which in a lot of countries in the global south, the national grid, you know, is already kind of overstretched and experiences blackouts and, and governments and countries are, are dealing with that grid infrastructure to begin with. So extending it to, you know, all corners of the country. Um, is, is often a, a real strain on their infrastructure. So we're dealing with infrastructure that, that is often very stretched and, and extending it over long, um, many kilometers would be very expensive. And also sometimes, you know, we see in some countries, this could be over mountains, through dense forests. Um, it, it really doesn't make sense. And it's not the most efficient way to bring um, electricity to these people. So that's why what we're seeing and what the good news is and what SE for All really focuses on is a new decentralized and democratized energy system. Um, so this is really relying on decentralized energy solutions such as mini grids or standalone systems like small solar home systems that are based on renewables that are proving that they can reach and service these um, communities with a lot more reliable power, um, it's clean energy, and it's it can be it's much more economical and efficient than grid extension is in the foreseeable future. But this decentralized approach really relies on close cooperation with the private sector, and therefore it's basically asking governments to create very strong enabling environments that include policies, regulations, incentive schemes to help the private sector reach those um, those in living in energy poverty. So that's the focus of my work at SE for All. I mean, SE for All has many programs, um, but uh, I lead the policy and regulations team. So we work directly with governments um, to help them put in place strong policies and regulations, as well as design national programs that support the private sector, reach these, um, these communities and these regions with clean and affordable technologies. So we take learnings from markets that are seeing booms in decentralized systems like Nigeria for mini grids, Bangladesh for solar home systems, or even Kenya for ethanol based cooking solutions. And we try to standardize these approaches and help governments deal with this increasingly decentralized but decarbonized energy systems. So I'll leave it there for now. Happy to go into further details and um, looking forward to also hearing the perspectives from the other panelists. So thank you. Back to you, Miriam. Great. Thank you very much, Hadley, and thank you for staying on time. Um, yes, so I just for um, anyone in the audience, the chat is open and the Q&A box is also open. So you can obviously keep your questions for the end and we'll get to them. Uh, but if you have any you know, burning questions or comment in the meantime, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll uh, compile them all and um, just get to them um, after the presentations from our speakers. Um, and our next speaker, um, I think if anyone um, who works in the energy poverty field has heard of Professor um, Stefan Buzakowski. Um, he's a professor of human geography at the University of Manchester, and he's an associate um, at the Institute of European Energy and Climate Policy. He's basically dedicated most of his professional career to combating energy poverty with research and exposing uh, underlying injustices and also advocating for um, ambitious state policy and working at all level from communities to international and government bodies um, in Asia and Africa as well as civil society. Uh, so we're very, very happy to be um, with him today and have him. Uh, so I'll just, yeah, give it to you, um, Stefan. Thank, thank you, Miriam. I uh, hope you can hear me. And that was incredibly generous and very humbling uh, introduction. Um, I, I'm just honored to be on this panel and then just listening to all these fascinating presentations. 
Um, so I've been trying to work on a global energy poverty agenda for a while now as, a, as someone who's uh, interested in uh, rethinking how we approach energy poverty and how we uh, also uh, connect the various stakeholders uh, in this field. At the University of Manchester, we have uh, something called the uh, International Energy Vulnerability Network. And uh, my colleague, uh, Manon Burbage, is also organizing International Energy Poverty Action Week, uh, parallel to this series, series of events. So we've been try trying to actively involve stakeholders. So what I thought I would do today, um, it's, um, I, th I think, Hadley, a previous speaker, summarized all of the key points about energy poverty so well, so what I thought I'd do today is, uh, rather than just repeat them, I would try to do something else, um, is just to show us what um, global stakeholders around energy poverty think at the moment about what we need to do. Um, I'm starting from the perspective that we have to, um, we have to build a net global energy poverty agenda that spans the global north and the global south. This has been my sort of point all of these years, that we can't separate these debates We've had a sort of separate debate in the North um, around fuel poverty, around affordability, and then there's been another debate around access in the global South. And my point has been, we can't have these two separate debates. It's all about basic uh, human dignity, basic needs everywhere. Uh, the global, we have to also think about a climate justice perspective. The global North has responsibility for the global South. So the reason why these problems exist in the global south is not because of the global south, but also because of how the global north has been, you know, the whole history of colonialism, everything needless to repeat. So we can't have this debate as if those, these two things are not connected. So what I've been trying to say is we have to do this together. So I'm, what, I'm, what we're doing right now with Dana Hernandez at University of Columbia and a group of other um, organizations from all across the world, we're trying to put together a global initiative around energy poverty. So I'm really good. it's really good to be in this session. I'll tell you more about it. But we've done very quickly, and I'm, I'm conscious of time, and we've done a, a, short, a short survey with stakeholders, with everyone involved. And I'm going to just show you some of the preliminary um, results of that survey. Uh, so uh, let's see if it's... Oh, Zoom is not allowing me to share my screen. <laughs> okay, let me see if that will happen now. Right. Um, sorry, it's not letting me share share the screen. So I'm just going to very quickly uh, show you some of these um, some of these main results and just tell you what what the key points that people raise are. Um, I might in the conversation later bring them up, uh, but what people keep saying is, for example, is that um, one of the key needs uh, that, that if they've, they've said is that we have to connect decent living standards to energy poverty, that we have to prioritize energy access. Uh, we've had about 20% uh, of respondents saying that we have to prioritize energy efficiency as well and affordability. So we have to link these dimensions together. What stakeholders have also said is we have to have a, a global grassroots net, network of energy poverty and we need to think also about connecting uh, online, connecting through shared networks throughout the year, throughout um, all of these connections, uh, throughout, um, uh, throughout all of these forums that exist. Um, so we have had about 30, 30 respondents so far and I'll put the link in the chat so you can, if those of you who are in the session would like to answer, respond to our survey, that would be great. We will publish the results shortly as well. So these are still preliminary results in any case. And Stefan, um, if you send us the link, that, we can um, we can share the screen for you. Um, and that will be um, easier if you want to show, or if you'd rather just present, that's also fine. That's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the link for the survey in the chat so people can see it. And again, um, would be great to get more, more feedback and input on that. Um, but I will just say that kind of the th key things that people are saying, um, first of all, that there's a need to connect um, these debates, but also that's what's coming through a lot in these responses we've had so far. We've had about 90 responses so far, so please do keep them coming. Um, that we have to actually start um, approaching energy poverty from the lived experience, from the, um, from the experience of how people, um, from on a day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis, lack either energy services 
or are struggling with energy supply chains, struggling with suppliers, struggling with companies, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this lived experience is universal. Whether you are in the global south or your global north, you're struggling with energy, you're still going to experience these issues. So um, again, these are things that, um, that people have said in the survey. And um, the, the other thing that's come through a lot, again, in the results, is that we have to link um, energy poverty and global, global uh, climate justice. The energy sufficiency principle is something that people have mentioned a lot. So they're saying that um, basically um, you, we have to reclaim the energy sufficiency principle as being something only about um, decreasing energy supply. That is something that has to happen in the global north, but in the global south, actually we need to be moving up to a level of energy supply that is needed for everyone. And where that threshold lies is we actually have to have a debate around where you set the threshold for energy sufficiency for a decent living standard and how it applies to different contexts. So that's something we'll be working on in the future. So, I mean, just to sort of briefly run you what's been, what we've been talking about, if these questions are raised further, I will try to get this running. So I have a few maybe graphs to show you, but it actually, I'm trying to capture the spirit of what's being said. And hopefully when we publish this, we might have another voice to add to everyone who's saying um, to the decision makers, to the powers that be, we have to, we, the things need to change, but we also have to build solidarity from the bottom up as a group of uh, organizations, a group of um, stakeholders trying to get things moving. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. I've put the link to the survey in the chat. If you can answer it, that would be great. And uh, there's more from us to come as well as, as we develop these results. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Saffron. That was um, that was really interesting. And yes, uh, we'll we have the link in the survey um, in in the chat, and everybody uh, take a couple minutes to fill it out and share it with um, anyone anybody who think might be interested. Um, and I think you know you mentioned um, lived lived experiences and and uh, the work on the ground. And now we'd like to zoom in a little bit um, with our colleague Leon uh, Leon Dulce, who's uh, the campaign support and linkages coordinator. Um, of the Legal Rights and Natural Resources Center, or LRC, uh, which is a legal policy research and advocacy institution um, established in 1987 that enables um, marginalized communities meaningful participation in policy reform and access justice. Um, Leon is based in the Philippines, um, and we're very, very um, happy to have him here and, and interested in, in what he has to say. Um, so Leon uh, has a presentation which um, will start now and hopefully um, we, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. All right, thank you, Miriam. Good evening, everyone from the Philippines. Uh, okay, so now the, the screen is showing. Um, so maybe we're going to add to the discussion uh, from another angle of the energy, the global energy industry. Uh, and it's uh, great that Professor Stefan mentioned the concept of energy sufficiency. It has to do with uh, the points that uh, uh, I would like to raise in this uh, ongoing discussion. And that has to do with the, the dangers of having that the same, same concept of endless growth uh, already applied to many industries now, but can be dangerously applied to our transition towards renewable energy. So we, we, we argue that uh, we cannot exchange one crisis for another, uh, and that is the climate crisis in exchange for Oh, I think we might have lost Leon. Um, let's see if he comes back oh you're back in uh large scale mining activities in the in the third world internet and it's going to uh, show a lot of land spikes here here and then anyway so that 500 percent increase uh would would have consequences to uh economies to countries that uh, uh, are the primary sources of uh, these uh, transition minerals. No? And the Philippines is one of them. So next slide, please. So here are just some, uh, some 
uh, examples of what transition minerals are demanded. Uh, of course, not all of these are actual uh, climate solutions, the actual energy transition solutions. There's no clear there, and that's up for debate, really. Uh, but if you look at uh, some of the demands for energy transmission and distribution energy systems, these are minerals that are uh, one of the top uh, uh, mineral productions here in the Philippines. So going to the next slide, please, would show you actually that uh, uh, this will have epic consequences for the Philippines because the Philippines is currently the second biggest nickel producer in the world. Uh, the, the picture at, uh, and the four jobs uh, in the Philippines, the destruction in the fourth largest coal. So these are minerals that will fuel definitely the energy transition, but at what cost for the Philippines? Where these uh, so on the next slide, uh, uh, the, the 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 gravity, you know, the gravity of what? Beyond uh, or currently? Sorry, we're having a hard time following. Sixty percent of Yes, go ahead. No, I was just saying we can hear you really well, but spikes? maybe if you cut your video, um, it might be easier for us to hear you. Let's try, let's try. How about it now? Better. It sounds better. Okay. All right. So so just uh, driving the point that the, the, there could be grave consequences for the Philippines if uh, uh, the demand for transition minerals uh, runs unchecked. 60% of mineral reserves in the Philippines have been found to be in conflict with uh, ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. 49% of approved mining projects are found to be in conflict with ancestral domains. Uh, and there, there are running reports on how mining and other extractives are one of the key drivers of extrajudicial killings of environmental defenders making actually the Philippines the deadliest country in Asia for environmental defenders and you know, ranging from first to third uh, uh, globally you know, in terms of environmental defender killings. So if we do not keep the uh, transition minerals uh, production in check, it will definitely have uh, adverse consequences for communities in the Philippines. So next slide, please. This is the uh, and uh, potential areas for for mining. and just examples of conflicts that this kind of mining is generating. Uh, on the top left photo, the first photo is uh, a barricade of indigenous Tuwali people uh, opposing the Australian Canadian Oceana Gold Mining blockade was dispersed because of the government's assertion of uh, approving the renewal of the contract. It was uh, to the problem, uh, which is the people's blockade, the military dispersed violently these two people. The uh, points to the southern part of the Philippines uh, is a uh, uh, indignation rally for uh, the the upper gold mining project in the south. No, so. These, these are just three examples of various uh, 
I, uh, if I record correctly. I'll escalate the attempt to hear Leon and invite the other panelists to also cut our cameras and hopefully that might um, help with hearing our colleague. Um, fingers crossed. This is really interesting. Right. So really apologies for, for the connectivity issues. Don't so apologize, to... Leon. This is the reality of right, you know, right, things. Right. <laughs> so final slide, finally, uh, is our assertion that if there is a call for a just energy transition, there should also be a call for a just minerals transition. And it's a transition that has to have these four principles, the principle of post-extractivism and you know, in line with energy sufficiency, uh, energy production and therefore minerals production should be based only on the need for social well-being and well within the ecological, the planetary limits. It should be anchored on justice and redistribution, where the governance of minerals should be democratized, where affected frontline community decide. It should be anchored on there should be due diligence mechanisms, especially uh, for, for energy companies, energy industries uh, that source these minerals for their production of uh, renewable energy technology. And finally, the concept of circularity, where where possible, we should look into the recycling of, uh, of metal. The need for uh, uh, excessive extractivism. So I would finish and hope we're able to contribute uh, to a deeper discussion of the of the issues around energies. No? Thank you. Thank you so much, Leon. That was that was really fascinating. Um, and uh, I think I'll just ask my colleagues if they can copy and paste the link in your presentation and paste it in the chat so everybody gets a chance to um, click on it and go see because I think it's also one of the things that abusing my power as moderator here. But, you know, in Europe specifically, a lot of climate justice organizations um, talk about renewable, but we also need to be aware of the fact that everything we do has consequences. And it's really important to um, keep this in mind that this is affecting the reality of, of people on the ground. And like you said it beautifully, this um, endless growth is really not something that we can sustain um, or something that anyone can um, or should push for. Um, I'm done. <laughs> getting off my soapbox. Um, I'll just call our last speaker, uh, last but not least, uh, Maimoni Obrijo, who's a climate justice activist uh, whose works cuts across Nigeria and the African region. We're very, very happy to have him here. Uh, Maimoni has been working with Environmental Rights Action, or ERA, which is Friends of the Earth Nigeria, for over a decade, um, starting off as a volunteer and then becoming staff. Uh, he's currently the administrative manager of ERA and the coordinator of the Climate Justice and Energy Program of Friends of the Earth Africa, which represents the whole region. Um, Zoom has decided that Maimoni and I are the same person, so I'll just cut my camera while he speaks so you don't have to see me twice. Maimoni, over to you. Thank you very much, Dion. Yeah, so my video is not that good. Okay, so um, I want to thank the speakers. Uh, they have actually laid a very good foundation, but I will be taking my presentation off uh, their old pattern because I am an activist, so I will be talking more on the politics and focusing more on the root causes of the energy crisis in Africa and um, conclude with the Friends of the Earth Africa Just Recovery Renewable Energy Plan for Africa. So this is a document that I think everybody needs to have, I need to read. Uh, when I'm done, I'm going to drop the link uh, on the chat box for everybody to have access to the document. So I want just to start with a preliminary uh, kind of information, how the crisis started in Africa. Uh, in the Nigeria, Niger Delta for 67 years now, oil has been extracted. And where the oil is extracted from, the people uh, who are low in abject poverty, they are also exposed to different environmental crises and abuses. And also when we call to energy poverty, these are places where energy is extracted from and uh, the people are also classified as the poorest in terms of uh, access to energy. 
you know, having uh, abundant of resources, but you cannot have access to it. So uh, the resources that is extracted in Nigeria and other parts of Africa has actually contributed uh, gravely to creating climate crisis globally. And of course, you can agree with me that Africa has witnessed the worst uh, cases of climate disasters globally. We have heard of the cyclone, uh, we have heard of the drought issues, we have of the desertification. Uh, I want to bring you to 2020, some cases uh, that happened in 2020. The year 2020, the world witnessed the issue of climate and COVID-19 crisis. Climate actually met COVID uh, in 2019. This year was the year when the climate crisis met the COVID-19 crisis, but unfortunately, the climate crisis did not stop for the world to focus on dealing with the COVID-19 health crisis. So both crises are human-made crises rooted in the way our political and economic system treats the earth and her people, driven by the laws for profit. Unfortunately, COVID-19 came as at the time the South African countries were still healing from the devastating cyclones Inda and Kenet that happened in 2019. Year 2022, we witnessed the climate crisis, COVID-19 crisis, and of course, the war. Why the crisis created by the climate and COVID-19 still lingers? We have seen how the invasion of Ukraine by Russia is mounting pressure on the Africa continent to help bridge the gap of the energy cut from Russia to other parts of Africa. Because of this pressure, uh, an African Union Technical Committee proposed uh, an Africa Common Position on Energy Access and Transition for adoption at COP27 in, 20, in 2022. Uh, civil society groups in Africa actually uh, uh, reviewed that uh, uh, committee report and we also made our own submission until it was a bit suspended. But the shocking thing that came out from that report is that it still called for coal and oil as the critical element of expanding energy access in Africa. That is the mentality that was created from the uh, Russia invasion on Ukraine because of the energy need of those in the global north to power their homes and businesses. Because of the war, we have seen in Nigeria's vice president, Osin Bajo, demanding the use of gas to transition out of dirty energies. Because of the war, today, Uganda and other African nations are pushing to embrace fossil fuel projects. Of course, we have seen the romance of the German government of Senegalese, Senegalese government to enter into a deal to export over 2.5 million tons of gas from Senegal to Germany. We have witnessed how Germany, who's supposed to champion a just transition uh, plan, returned uh, to coal. What we need to focus our attention in is the fact that we need to transit to renewable energy and abandon all forms of uh, uh, fossil fuels. It's essential that we must move away from harmful fossil fuels toward a transformed energy system that is clean, renewable, democratic, and actually serves its people. Of course, you've heard the other speaker talk about energy democracy and energy sufficiency. That is what we, we should be dealing with. Of course, despite the push for oil and gas infrastructure in Africa, half of its population lack access to electricity. And over 900 million uh, Africa uses the energy generated from burning of wood. This uh, place Africa in a level of high uh, energy poverty. And there are documented cases of asthma and many other respiratory diseases because of this dirty energy. And whereas uh, those who come to extract this energy uh, uh, enjoy cleaner energy elsewhere, and those that own the resources are exposed to the danger that comes from uh, this uh, energy uh, extraction of these energy resources. These are the reasons why 
uh, friends of the East Africa decided to come up with a document called the Just Recovery Renewable Energy Plan for Africa. Thinking that this document is going to be a, some, a tool in the hands of African government to plan uh, a, a, a proper energy transition pathway. Also, this is a document that we feel is going to be a tool in the hands of uh, world leaders to uh, direct their energies to a more uh, uh, sustainable and real concrete solutions. But today we are seeing the opposite. The Just Recovery Renewable Energy uh, Plan for Africa is a document that was prepared to address previous and future climate disasters. It is meant to support a just recovery from climate and COVID crisis. Obviously, it is now an essential tool to respond to the Russia invasion on Ukraine that has exposed the world craving for dirty energies. The, the plan, uh, a vision, an innovative way of boosting people-centered re uh, recovery as it will create jobs at the same time as reducing emission and addressing energy inequality. The plan offers a practical opportunity to change the trajectory of energy development, distribution and assets. It opens up energy system to a more democratic processes. Of course, that is what the other speakers are calling for frees them from the power of transnational cooperations and enables people and communities to access sufficient energy. That is why the Just Recovery uh, Renewable Energy Plan for Africa demands a drastic reduction of fossil fuel emission and calls for powering Africa with 100% energy for all, while staying under the 1.5 degree Celsius scenario. Current estimates, of course, suggest that if no action is taken now, the global CO2 emission will approach an alarming level around 2050, which will certainly cause a disastrous uh, climate crisis and will be a death knell for most of Africa and many parts of the world. The plan also makes case for African government to recognize socially owned and control renewable energy as a right and ensure that it is prioritized in policy agenda and fiscal budgets. Of course, you see that the plan, the plan from the African Union is contrary to what the plan is calling for. And the plan has warned that energy should not be developed solely for profit, but to ensure dignity of all people and reduce energy poverty so as to catalyze sustainable societies. The plan also calls on African government to work with all people and remove all obstacles that may retard progress and or distract from attaining this goal. The plan also shows that Africa needs approximately 130 billion uh, USD a year between now and 2050 as an investment towards achieving the 100% energy goal that we talked about. And the plan for that made some kind of uh, suggestion on how these funds can actually be generated to re, in order to reduce the uh, energy poverty uh, in Africa. So the plan also to make demand for the developed world to meet its long-standing climate finance commitment in compensating the developing countries. That is one. Uh, the plan also call for um, uh, debt consolidation for Africa and also implementation of measures to eliminate tax evasion and the flow of illicit funds. I read somewhere in the document where they were talking about if the world uh, billionaires uh, today, if they are tasked just 5% of their income, uh, the world will generate over $1.5 trillion uh, a year, which is enough to solve the Africa, uh, the other uh, uh, global South energy needs. That's but today, only the poor people pay tax the rich evade tasks. And this is something that uh, is of a great challenge to, to us. Friends of the Earth Africa believes that a just recovery energy plan for Africa built on environmental, social, gender, and economic justice is just is urgently needed to address all the impact of the multiple interrelated crises across the continent, which are being compounded by the neoliberal doctrine. Such a recovery plan must be centered on the well being of people and the planet and be based on a justice perspective so it can contribute to solving all these systemic crises. 
last year, because of the high level of demand for dirty energies, uh, the, the, the pressure on Africa government from those uh, from Global North who wants to bridge their energy gap, we came up with another publication that actually plays a warning to the leaders of the world to say, please look, don't let Africa burn. This is another document that everybody also needs to have access to. Because Don't Let Africa Born also came up with a critical recommendation that they, what is needed is a just uh, uh, recovery renewable energy plan for Africa and the world. I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, that was that was amazing. That was, um, yeah, and a lot of things being connected and, and going back to what was said um, earlier on the panel, the principle of sufficiency, of well-being, of people being the center of um, policy making rather than profit, um, and also things that were said in the past two days for those who attended on taxations, for instance. Um, and what always strikes me is, is when you hear regular kind of EU, at least, policy discussions from decision makers um, on the global perspective, the EU pre presents itself as the leader, as um, having the solutions as doing things, but actually, no people have the solutions on the ground, and and you know the those two reports we have, so which are being pasted in the chat, the the one specifically from Friends of the Earth Philippine, um, and and the one from Fo Africa show that there are practical solutions and very concrete demands that people have that just need to be listened to and um, and applied very simply. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think we have a few questions in the chat for, for people, um, but I wanted to also give an opportunity to all of our panelists, um, if you want to, well, turn back on your cameras maybe, um, or if you have any questions, reactions from what you heard before, um, questions to each other, um, that's very welcome and we can do a bit of um, time on that and before we open the question to uh, the audience, so if you have any questions, just feel free to put them either in the chat or in the Q&A box and we're already um, compiling them. Um, I see Stefan, you've unmuted. Assuming you wanna jump in. I, I, was gonna, I was gonna type it in, but it would be great to get some uh, thoughts from the remaining panelists in particular. Um, I saw a, a study that was just published uh, last week that said that um, the combined uh, gas uh, crisis, so we had a gas price crisis and we had uh, last year, then we had a global energy crisis and a cost of living, then the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So all of that has come together to create, I think, um, a, a really sort of a perfect storm in terms of um, energy poverty globally. So I saw a study last week that said that, um, you know, they'd done sort of some quantitative analyses that said that actually, mm, there were global effects of this and they could really see a lot of the, some of the modest gains that were made uh, in previous years being rolled back, uh, particularly in Africa. So it'd be really good to hear from the panelists if this is reflected in their everyday experience um, and particularly whether, because one of the concerns we have is that in fact, um, this is not going to be a short-term situation, even though prices are starting to come down, utilities are not passing this on to the consumers, so wholesale price isn't reflected in the retail price. So uh, I wonder if this is also the experience of the other speakers, that in fact, uh, this has actually become another situation where uh, not only is there impact on energy poor, but also that, um, you, that big companies have seen another chance to also to reap more profits off of the backs of, of the poor globally. So it'd be good to get some feedback and thoughts on that. It's, I think it's not enough, they're not an um, issue that's discussed enough. Yes, thanks, Stefan. Um, I'll pass to Maimoni if you um, want to react, just because Stefan mentioned um, Africa specifically. Uh, and then Leon, if you have a reaction, and then um, we'll finish with Hadley. I'm sorry, I'm lost at the question. Maybe I was a bit distracted. I don't know. So can someone just summarize the question for me? I, I can summarize it. Can you hear me, my money? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, please. 
Okay, thank you. No, I was asking if you have seen any impacts from, uh, you mentioned it briefly, maybe you can expand a little bit more from the global energy price crisis around gas in the area where you work. And also if you've seen any impacts from utilities getting richer from it, because uh, we've definitely seen it in some of the contexts where we work. Basically, they are um, utilities are reaping massive profits from the difference between high retail price and often the lower wholesale price, particularly of some fossil fuels. Well, um, it's really a very sad situation. I want to give, for, the, for example, uh, the Nigeria situation. Uh, of course, uh, Nigeria is one of the uh, big, big nations producing oil globally. And that is where the world actually rely on the, uh, uh, the resources from Nigeria, the crude oil and gas from Nigeria, as we speak, there, there is an ongoing uh, West African gas pipeline that has been uh, laid that will be running towards uh, Morocco. And where is that uh, project running to? You, you, you will know that that is uh, a channel to export gas to Europe, okay? Well, as we speak, it is high level of energy poverty in Nigeria. Uh, even those that cannot afford gas for cooking, it's only the very rich that cannot use gas for cooking. People are being pressured to start going back to using uh, fuel wood for cooking, you know, which is something that we have discouraged over the years because of the health implication on people, because of the high level of deforestation that is going to create. Even the kerosene that is, be, that is needed to light up the homes by the common man uh, for kerosene lanta is no longer affordable in Nigeria. The price recently is almost like it has increased more than 100%, more than 200%, because you can see the uh, a liter of kerosene is even uh, competing with uh, uh, a kg of gas. Okay, which means even the poor people cannot even buy the common kerosene, which is the uh, uh, commonly used fuel for cooking in local communities. So local communities rely on fuel wood to uh, add, uh, uh, for cooking and also power their homes. Of course, most of the things that are actually helping out are some of these uh, uh, renewable energy, rechargeable lab gadgets. But the prices are also on the high side. It's only the, uh, the rich that can actually have access to those gadgets because they are actually needed. They can find a way to find a way to charge and they use it at home. But if you don't have the resources, how will you be able to buy those gadgets? So that is how we are calling for subsidies in the areas of renewable energies. And also we are calling on the world to say, look, I don't know, the policies are weak globally anyway. The policies are weak in terms of where resources are extracted. So a country like Nigeria, like my community, we don't have access to light, but on a daily basis, the only light our people have access to, the electricity they have, is not electricity, but the only lighting system they have access to is the flame of gas flare, you know, that turns the community to uh, a daylight hour during the night. That is the only thing that my people have access to coming from an oil producing community. But the electricity to power their homes is missing. And whereas millions of dollars are generated from that community from oil that is extracted from those places. So these are peculiar cases that are common to most parts of Africa. Yeah, thank you very much, Mel Um, Yeah, that was, that was very powerful. Uh, Leon, do you have any uh, contributions or any thoughts from your perspective to um, the question? I think I would just add that we have a similar situation where the global fossil fuel situation is affecting uh, the inflation rates in our economy. It's affecting, you know, uh, linked industries down to manufacturing, down to uh, food production, and it's having the consequences on the daily lives of the Filipino people. And I think that links to a, a different question uh, in the in the chat uh, uh, on whether civil society or social movements are already 
uh, talking about or actively pushing just transition, uh, I don't think we're there yet. And that's because a lot of, for instance, trade unions or farmer associations are struggling with the daily economic crisis uh, and efforts are still focused on, inter on finding the intersection between those daily economic struggles and the strategic uh, uh, aspiration, if you will, for, for a just transition, uh, not only on energy, but on minerals and other aspects of the economy as well. Thank you so much, Leon. Um, Hadley, do you want to have do you have any concluding words on that point, and then we'll open up to um, the broader chat. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, Maimoni already mentioned um, the clean cooking situation, which you know, as we know, is already dire, and then this energy crisis has um, put additional stress on it. So I I won't repeat that. Maybe I can speak around the, you know, the off-grid electrification sector. Certainly at the beginning of COVID, when we were seeing significant supply chain issues, this was um, a, a big concern for those companies that were providing um, off-grid solar and mini-grid um, electrification to rural and remote communities. That certainly did put... Um, and now, again, a perfect storm was already mentioned. We're seeing that as well. Um, a key issue in this sector um, is that a lot of these um, private sector companies, they rely on funding from financiers or even donors that come in you know, US dollars or euros, whereas they're getting their payments for their services from, from the communities and from the households um, in local currency. So, and we even see, you know, even the African Development Bank is lending to these companies to help them scale up in USD. So these companies are really having a hard time with fluctuation that we see on, on, on keeping their books balanced and their, and their finances is making sense. And particularly in the mini grid sector where their tariffs that they charge are regulated by the government. Um, with such dramatic fluctuations, um, you know, the, the, the economics are, are giving the businesses a really hard time. And we as a focused on scaling up the off-grid electrification and mini-grid electrification sector right now situation of even making sure that those that are already installed and those that are there and in communities are able to keep power running to these people um so yeah it's it's um, caused stresses across the energy system and i think as with any crises unfortunately those in the the uh, global south and and those that are kind of the most vulnerable are are bearing the the most brunt of the impact Thank you so much, Hadley. Um, while you're here, I'll just um, <laughs> fire away a question that was for you. Um, that So I'll just read out the question for everyone. Uh, you specifically mentioned engaging with the private sector in off-grid development. Uh, does AC, SE for All also recognize the role of community energy and provide policy recommendation on how governments can create enabling environments for it? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when we look at electrification from an, from an off-grid perspective, um, from a policy perspective, let's off-grid solar, like solar home systems and mini grids are treated very differently, right? Because we can imagine in, in any country, I mean, I live here in Vienna, if I want to buy a solar panel and uh, put it outside of my window and, and charge my phone with that, um, you know, the government doesn't really need to be involved in that transaction. It's kind of seen very much as a, as a home appliance. But when it comes to, to mini grids, now you're talking about building infrastructure in the country, distributing energy, something that has traditionally been done by utilities, often state-owned utilities. And so that's where we see that um, regulation and um, very clear guidelines is, is much more um, important. So the role of community energy often comes up when we're talking about mini grid regulations. And certainly, I mean, every country is different, of course, and there are kind of different ways in the legal framework that a, a town or a municipality 
um, has kind of jurisdiction and powers um, over, over their community, over their, the, the inhabitants there. Um, but in almost every country where we've worked, you know, we've been writing into the mini grid regulation, some form of community acceptance and buy in. Um, in some cases, you know, certain governments will advise us that they would like, you know, certain uh, percentage of ownership of those assets to be by the community, to be run by the community, certain number of jobs created from that infrastructure to be held by community members. Um, other times it's it's even in, in kind of investments um, from, from a kind of community development fund or a farmer's cooperative, for example, is often like a, an organized um, um, body um, with, with also holdings that they're able to invest in these kinds of systems. So we can't say that there's a blanket um, way to write that into regulation for all countries. But certainly when it comes to mini grids, because it's so deeply ingrained with kind of community politics and, and jurisdiction, um, that it's critical that that is considered and, and taken into account in the regulation. And also that the private sector companies that may be working across, um, you know, five or six countries in, in a given region also really understand exactly what it is, what agreement they need to enter into the community so that everyone's expectations um, are aligned when, um, when creating the, this decentralized infrastructure. Great, right, thank you so much. Um, and you mentioned companies, so I'm just gonna jump on that point um, on another question that um, is in the chat that is basically kind of summing it up um, on, something that has come up during the forum in, in yesterday's session and, and the day before, which is um, the role of corporations, big business, and maybe more specifically fossil fuel companies and the way that kind of big energy is trying to um, hijack decision-making process, both with kind of very old school influence, but also with kind of technical solutions and innovation. And, and um, I think this is relevant to all of our speakers. So for instance, Leon's presentation also mentioned, you know, extractive industry and, and the mining industry, which is also very powerful in this sector. Um, and so the question is, is kind of just about whether all of you agree with that assessment um, and what should be the strategies um, put in place to ensure a global right to clean and affordable energy, um, which presumably will also um, big business doesn't necessarily want that. So how do we um, kind of ensure that and, and whether you agree with that uh, or not? I'll um, start with Stefan and then um, move on to Leon and, and Maimoni and then back to Hadley. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I think uh, what where we can intervene is the framework of international law and particularly the growing uh, framework of climate law and global climate regulation. This is something where increasing number of countries are signing up to and we have to link climate justice to energy justice um, that's that's for me i think we cannot talk about climate change we cannot talk about mitigation commitments and requests on, glo on the global south to do things without also putting pressure on global north company to support the process and to um, find a way to channel some of their vast profits into this um into this reducing this massive injustice so for me the, i i will continue to be i think we have to be advocates for whenever the climate debate comes up we have to be also linking into energy justice and all of the questions that arise around uh, and actually the other thing is that if we i think if we are able to connect these more clearly there some of the resistance that is coming from countries in the global south will be will be decreased because the, 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 this is ultimately we have to work with the global north companies uh, because that's where the biggest problems are but if, if we are able to use these frameworks and these discourses to put pressure on them and we link that discourse and I think that is the that is a site of intervention that has to happen at the moment that's I think for me the first place we need to to work with. Yeah, that's a very interesting point um, to to keep in mind for all of us. Um, Leon, do you want to speak of um, kind of the experience with um, 
big business and I guess specifically mining. So definitely agree that there's corporate capture on virtually all avenues of climate solutions, whether it's on uh, energy or on minerals. Uh, it's a reality here in the Philippines, definitely. Uh, I think there are two approaches that we, we can suggest, and it's similar to what Professor Stefan mentioned. Definitely a push for bigger reg corporate regulations. So uh, in, in here in the Philippines, we are uh, pushing for the filing hopefully soon. No? And uh, uh, this is the filing of a climate accountability law uh, that establishes uh, firm uh, uh, regulatory provisions on uh, 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 the duty of care. No, the accountability of, of corporations vis-a-vis -vis their, their climate impacts. Uh, similarly, in the mining industry, there is a long-standing policy proposal, the Alternative Minerals Management uh, Bill, which also aims to regulate the mineral industry uh, uh, simply to, to base it on people's needs and not corporate greed. Uh, so there are policy proposals. It's an uphill struggle because corporations or you know big business are also in legislation here in the Philippines uh, uh, so there's also a, the approach on trying to achieve policy determining uh, jurisprudence through litigation uh, uh, and this is more on per case case to case uh, approaches on specific companies and hopefully the results would uh, establish jurisprudence that is applicable across the entire whether energy or the minerals industry. Uh, lastly, these strategies cannot work if it is not anchored on people power. And as I showed earlier, it is actually the people's barricades on the ground that are virtually effective in stopping uh, uh, these projects. So any legal litigation or policy strategy should complement social movements, should complement uh, the, uh, the aspirations for democratizing governance, uh, especially at the community level. So it also you know, jives with the idea of having off-grid uh, energy systems. It's definitely based on the people's will on the ground. So that's what we hope to push for. Huh? Yeah, that's a very important point of um, community self-determination and, and they are the most powerful forces on the ground. That's very, very true. Um, Maimoni, do you want to add anything? Yeah, you know, one of the campaigns that we lead uh, at, the, at the Friends of the Earth space is right for the people, rule for corporations, okay? So um, there is need for uh, a kind of a, a, a global binding uh, uh, mechanisms like the UNFCC uh, uh, platform, we have not seen any kind of uh, binding mechanism that is binding on nations. Okay, there is no clear commitment made from there. So it is difficult to actually evaluate and sanction when necessary. So these platforms, they need to introduce those binding mechanisms so that there will be room for sanctions. And one of the things that we have uh, noticed is that most of the oil industries like Shell, they cannot do uh, in the Netherlands what they do in Nigeria. So in a situation where uh, the host countries where resources are being extracted, in a situation where their policies are weak, it will be a kind of uh, a global standard for that cooperation uh, to be evaluated based on the uh, environmental policies of their own host nation. Uh, their own nation. In so doing, they can be checkmated. Because, because if the policies are weak and allow like that, they will just do what they want to do without putting into consideration that they are breaking the law. So if you are breaking a law, law of environmental law of one nation, it should also reflect in the environmental space globally. So the world should also be in their touch light on every cooperation extracting resources anywhere, whether it's their country or not. So I think these are some of the things that we also had. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights needs to be domesticated because it clearly stated 
uh, I think Article 3 there is talking about right to life. When you talk about right to life, anything that uh, militates against human survival is actually breaking that human, uh, universal declaration to human rights. So it needs to be domesticated and such of those, uh, many of those provisions need to also be enforced with global monitoring mechanisms put in place. Thank you so much, my money. Um, Hadley, do you have any? I mean, yeah, the, uh, these large companies, and you know, what, what we're starting to see is, particularly in the energy access and renewable space, you know, where some companies were previously only engaged through their kind of seat corporate social responsibility, some could even throw the word greenwashing out of there, you know, with small projects that was trying to kind of just improve their image. What we are noticing from a lot of really big companies, particularly when we look at those that are kind of invited to speak at the UN General Assembly and, and announce their climate commitments, is we're starting to see an integration of renewables and some more climate conscious practices being integrated and mainstreamed into their main business. So it's not just corporate social responsibility anymore. Some of these companies that are on the forefront are acknowledging and understanding that if they're to have a, a long future um, as a business in this uh, global society, that they need to figure out how to do that more climate consciously. And I think we need to encourage those companies to do more, showcase them um, so that those that are, are behind can follow in their footsteps. I think we we can't do this energy transition or or achieve our climate goals with without these large polluters and emitters being on board um, and finding a framework within which we can work with them, albeit quite tense at times, um, I think is going to be an important part of this solution. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to another question. Um, that has been mentioned and several panelists have mentioned and I'll just, whoever wants to answer, just um, jump in is uh, the idea of energy sufficiency. So kind of this um, difference between energy efficiency and energy sufficiency. And the question is, um, how can we go from energy efficiency to talking more about sufficiency in an equitable way across regions? Uh, and how can you bring sufficiency at the center of policymakers discussion? And I'll add to that if there was any um, success or any kind of good example or, or a good way to put it that um, that has worked for our panelists in the past, or if this is also something that's absolutely not a discussion um, yet. So I'll just open to anyone who wants to jump in. Um, Miriam, maybe I can I can kick us off because you know this is actually a, a, a big debate um, within particularly the energy access community. Um, you know what is energy access that um, powers you know um, a a sufficient livelihood? You know, is just a solar lantern enough? Can we call a person electrified uh, if they have a small solar lantern? At SE for All, we believe no. We go, um, we work with the um, World Bank multi tier framework. Um, it has uh, four tiers of, or sorry, five tiers, because there's tier zero um, of energy access, and we consider um, tier two and above. And so that means, you know, that you in your home have enough electricity to power three lights, a fan, mobile phone charging, and if you had a, an efficient TV or, or radio, or even um, a, a very efficient like cooling device, like a small, a small fridge. But of course, that's just in the home. And as we talked about before, you know, you need access to energy across community services in your schools, in your hospitals, street lighting, these kinds of things. So there is debate in the sector of, of how do we measure that? How do we uh, benchmark ourselves? And, you know, there's a, it's called the modern energy minimum. 
This is the idea that um, every person is entitled and has a right to a thousand kilowatt hours per year across their in their community life in their in their business as well as at home and i think that conceptually this is a really good benchmark um, for understanding um, that energy has to be more than just a solar lantern but is very difficult because uh, if it's something that you cannot track um, then it's it's very hard to kind of um help governments uh, design policies when we don't really know the, the baseline where we're starting from. So it's certainly a debate within our industry right now of how do we track you know, access to a sufficient amount of, of energy um, for, for a dignified and, and a life that one can pull themselves out of poverty. But it's it's not it's not so clear on exactly what metric we're going to use. You know, SDG seven really only focuses on household electrification, so it would require a real rethinking of of how we track this whole sector to begin with. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you, Hadley. Stefan. Yeah, I can't agree more. Um, I mean, it was uh, Hadley. You summarized it so well. I just just to add something, maybe that was that came through our survey, and I can. I think I can finally show it to you. This question came up in every element of the survey. So you can see in this word cloud from the response we've had so far, access needs minimum, uh, it comes through all the time. When we ask people what you think the key debate is, they said decent living standards. Um, so, I mean, it's just, I think it is absolutely the central question that we need to discuss <clears throat> for me. I think we're not doing this democratically enough. We have to start from the grassroots and we have to have mechanisms that it's not something that's decided by experts in a room somewhere, but it's actually, that's, I didn't articulate it very well, I think at the beginning, but we have to start from the lived experience and we have to think what it means to be living with X number of kilowatts in a particular context. And we have to then think about regionally sensitive thresholds as well. And I just can't echo enough what Hadley said around SDG 7, which is focused on conventional electrification. It's like looking at 20 years ago, what was the debate and not what should be the debate now and for the next 50 years. We can't think of large scale electric, it's this very developmentalist framing of what we need to do around energy justice. Um, and it's efficiency but sufficiency not as reduction, but actually improving living standards and thinking about what's sufficient in every given context has to be the center of the debate. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that there's probably not a one size fits all definition or um, it doesn't look like, it's not gonna look the same everywhere in, in, in the world. And I think that's a, that's a really good thing to keep in mind, um, especially when developing policy. Um, Maimoni and, and Leon, do you want to come in on that question too? Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, yeah. Maimoni, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, the issue of energy sufficiency and uh, uh, an access uh, is a thing of the right that everybody should have, you know, the right that everybody should have. Uh, but what we see today is only the rich that can boost of energy access and sufficiency. Uh, our findings in uh, community engagement show that the people are actually willing to pay for better services. They are willing to pay for constant. Uh, they are paying, not that they are not paying, they are paying a lot for uh, access to energy, but they hardly see it. Just as if the rich people who are actually in control, in charge, they are also raping and uh, uh, of course, stealing from the people because they are paying and they are not seeing what they are paying for. And you see a few that are, are able to generate their energy, they have peace. Like uh, in, in era, we, 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 we run on solar. We are not connected to national grid and we have peace. Prices of uh, uh, diesel and fuel does not really concern us, okay? We, because we have constant electricity, some of my colleagues, they are not connected to national grid. They have their access to their own energy, they generate their own energy, and they have peace. The local people that we serve, they also need that peace. And how can we do that? Government need to step in 
to subsidize this. Even if they give them access to this electricity and spread the money for them to pay for a period of 20 years or 10 years, the people are willing to cling to that because having access to constant electricity that is clean is something is very desirable to our people. Yeah, yeah, really great point. Um, thank you so much, my money. Uh, Leon, you can conclude for us. Yeah, um, so I think the aspirational response would be if, if there would be a national law that comprehensively uh, addresses the power, the energy framework that we have, which is anchored on privatization, that's the EPIRA law, no? Uh, it's a privatization law. Uh, and so that really, uh, deregulates the industry and so there's basically corporate capture. Uh, what has been practical in the past decades are you know piecemeal litigations and uh, administrative complaints uh, uh, attacking the different aspects of the energy privatization framework that we have in the Philippines uh, and so hopefully that builds up you know, and uh, creates a, a substantial body of uh, uh, jurisprudence. Uh, there, there is also a more effective but complementary approach would be, as mentioned before, no, uh, a bottoms up approach. And there are uh, a lot of uh, initiatives for distributed renewable energy systems uh, that, is, that are coupled with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, customary governance and laws of uh, indigenous people's communities uh, or, or cooperatives of, uh, uh, at the village level. No? And hopefully it demonstrates practical alternatives, although not yet at scale necessary for, for the entire society. Uh, I think in addition to what has already been mentioned, it's important to build narratives around this uh, you know, uh, pockets of, of alternative solutions uh, uh, because people, they, they, don't, they don't decide on facts, they decide on emotions and really uh, amplifying the stories of indigenous peoples with their renewable energy systems, uh, amplifying the stories of uh, communities, you know, uh, that the David against Goliath set up against corporations on the ground. Uh, it's an important tool that we really have to build on as a global uh, a global movement no? uh, to really promote our alternatives towards energy sufficiency. Uh, there are attempts, for instance, to have people's plans on the ground, uh, community-based plans on how they want to manage their resources, how they want to plan their uh, land use, water use economy. And hopefully this becomes uh, in, the in the next few decades, this becomes federated up to the national level until you know uh, we get substantial uh, changes in our society, hopefully. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and it's, yeah, if you have any additional resources on um, this kind of people plan uh, that you can share, I think a lot of us would be very interested to hear. Um, and yeah, I think also, like you said, the, the storytelling and the narrative is, is really, uh, important a lot of the time around this topic it's it's also very kind of I don't know reductive uh, stories of you know oh people are victims when it's actually um, not the case and people are fighting back and, and they're reclaiming um, their land and their resources and, and fighting for their communities and that's also the way we should you know tell people's stories um, if we're going to tell anyone's story it should be that story um, so thank you so much for that we have about seven minutes left to just advance warning to the audience I'll there's another question I want to get to but if you have any burning um question um just jump in now is your is your moment and you might regret it later um so yeah this last question is is for Hadley I'll just combine because it's two different questions but one question is very specifically so maybe that can be done shortly um on some successes you mentioned in Bangladesh and Nigeria in providing off-grid renewable energy um and if there are kind of rural or urban and what made them successful um and then the kind of question uh, is is also very similar of the difference between the rural and urban environments um, in the global south and um, yeah any kind of good example or, or criteria of, of success that you would um, that you would want to share with us. 
Sure. I mean, yeah, uh, key success factors is <laughs> is uh, not an not an easy question, um, and something that we're we're constantly, you know, trying to look at um, different, uh, yeah, case studies that that have experienced success and what was really the the key factor that that made that happen, so that we can try and and promote that approach and and replicate it elsewhere. I mean, I think. Yeah, I mentioned um, solar home systems in Bangladesh was definitely um, the the forerunner and one of the first movers in in off grid solar. Um, in Nigeria, we're seeing um, you know more and more mini grids being built, and and that program running. Maybe not to speak to a specific, and there are more, of course. So it's not to say those are the only ones. If I can think of really what is the common denominator with the programs that we see that are having success is that it's the national government, first of all, um, believing in off-grid energy systems and also the importance of clean cooking. That's that's first and foremost very important. I think we have to acknowledge that um, there are a lot of policymakers out there that are still thinking about developing energy systems in a very traditional way based off how it's happened in the global north, which is just pure grid extension. So having a government that really um, understands that the, the, the energy future will be a decentralized and renewable one is obviously a first kind of prerequisite. Um, and then when we go beyond that, I really think the critical success factor is combining policy with um, nationally driven financial incentives and support mechanisms. So whether that's um, end user subsidies, demand side subsidies, these are really important. I think we all need to remember that if, if you are in a household that's connected to a national electric grid, you are getting subsidized electricity. There's no way around that. And so whether the government is, you know, supporting um, the, the utility in, in terms of bailouts or, or it's, it's a state-driven company, that is a form of subsidy. So to expect an off-grid provider or a mini-grid to do that with some of the most rural and remote communities sometimes, you know, have hard to get to by days of, of road travel working with also communities that have very low affordability, it's just not realistic. So I think the governments that combine a really strong and clear enabling environment with some kind of um, subsidy or incentive mechanism, acknowledging that, okay, this these companies, these off-grid um, electric providers are going to be actually um, doing our utilities a favor by uh, providing reliable power to these communities. I think that's really the when you combine those two things to reach um, those those remote communities. That's when you start to see real scale happening in in different markets. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have a bonus question. I'm going to try to fit it in in the three minutes we have left. Um, but it's a question specifically for for Leon and and for Maimoni. It, so that we have a lot of people on the Zoom who kind of maybe work in the field or you know. I'm assuming mostly based in the global north or working on global um, perspective. And, and my question is, what would you like to see us do more of? How can people really um, make sure that we are not counterproductive? At least my position is sometimes the things you see from um, some organizations is not necessarily what is needed and, and, and that can kind of set us back or, or be um, not as useful as it could be. So what if, if there was maybe one thing that you would like people um, working on energy poverty, energy justice, climate justice um, in their region or globally, what would you like to see them do more of? Um, I'll just, Leon, I'll just throw that to you and then, and then my money can also jump in. Okay, thanks, Miriam. I think uh, a bit more, you know, conscientiousness about how any proposals in the globe have ultimately adverse consequences for the global. And then one, uh, as I mentioned, the link between, you know, industry towards the extractivist uh, industries and that that's the, the the global value chains so 
working more on holding uh, uh, multinationals, national corporations to their interest down the value chain towards sources of, of materials in the Philippines, sources of uh, a concrete example of making to, 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 to the frontline struggles here in the Philippines. And really a, a lot more people-to-people -people solidarity. Uh, uh, of course, we had the pandemic, but more solidarity visits to really see what is happening in the front lines of extractivism in the Philippines at the, with the indigenous communities. Uh, that simple show of support has a lot of, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, uh, significant impact for the morale, for the, for the, what they call this, for the continuing struggles of indigenous people people's farmers, fisher folk, local communities in the uh, and that would give you a clue of how your work at the global North level be more relevant to that. Thank you. Yeah, that that's very true. Um, my man, if you want to come very quickly, I'll just take yes, thirty seconds. Uh, from I think uh, one of the things we need to focus on is uh, um, policies that support uh, the effective implementation of. Uh, real concrete renewable energy action. Uh, secondly, there is need high need for community need assessment because you cannot give to a people uh, electricity when they're in need of water. Okay, so the reason why most of these projects fail is because there is no concrete community need assessment and consent from the people. That was short and sweet and Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. For, this was fascinating. Um, we have a lot of homework, things to read, things to learn, people to contact. Um, check in the chat. The, the amazing team has been compiling resources and, and from the speakers, and I'm sure you can also get in touch with anyone you would like to um, that has spoken in the session. Uh, we're now uh, having a break probably for lunch for most of us. And then the next session will be at half past two. Uh, you probably have the link um, in your inbox or uh, on the website. So I'll just uh, see you all of you in an hour. And thank you so much to all our amazing speakers. Um, that was really very enlightening and fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.